Okay, so myself, I'm Rosie. Sean, Carlton and Emily decided that we would speak about our experiences with PSSD because we're both or we're all in our early 20s, mid 20s. Um, and this has got to be probably one of, if not the worst thing that could possibly happen to you at 100%. this age, apart from the obvious, like, you know, um, massive accident or other diseases. This is right up there with the worst of the worst. So we just thought there's not really any videos of anyone talking about it. There's no group discussion. When I first got PSSD, it was like no one, no one spoke about it. Like I didn't want to talk about it at all because I just wanted it to just, I'm just going to fix it. And then I'm just going to get on, I'm just going to get on with my life. But as more and more time's gone on, I've realized like how important we've all realized how important it is that we talk about this because otherwise if we don't start talking about it now, the message will not get out there. And yeah, we, we really do risk like so many more years of our lives being stuck like this. If people don't start to realize how much we need help. So that's why I have all of these lovely people. I'm from Australia. Sean is I'm from the USA. And then I'm from Canada. And I'm from England. So it kind of just goes to show like, you know, I didn't know any of these people. Like we found each other online because we both were searching the same issues that we had. Um, and it, yeah, it really does show like how broad and how wide this problem spreads. Um, so we just thought we'll do like a little talk today about just how this illness has affected us and our personal lives because it's easy to see it's easy to read about PSSD online, but when it is actually your life and like it's the symptoms that you have every day, it changes things a lot. It's not just it's not just something that you randomly Google at like four PM. It's like it's really life changing. So yeah, um, I think we'll just kind of go straight into it. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over like our experiences. How did you get PSSD? You can kind of get it from starting a drug, from stopping a drug, or you can get it after you stop. So I kind of wanted to go into people's experiences. Maybe Carlton, you can start. How did yeah, you get yeah, thank you. Okay, so how did I get PSSD? Okay, so I was put on uh, nortriptyline during my teens uh, for IBS. Nortriptyline is a tricyclic first uh, generation antidepressant. And uh, I stayed on it for quite a few years, uh, probably about seven. I didn't really have any side effects, like not, not noticeable, you know, so I didn't didn't really notice anything and it, it wasn't until last year uh back in about february when my gp uh said you know you've been on this drug for a long time it's probably best if you come off it you know you're probably not seeing the benefits of ibs for this anymore and so I, you know believing doctors i just i was just like yeah sure we'll we'll uh we'll do this but he said um that uh, no triptyline would be getting discontinued by uh, the NHS in uh, which is the mainline uh, healthcare system here in England. Um, it would be getting discontinued. So he said, "What we're going to do you is what we're going to do is we're going to switch you. I'll switch you to a different drug, and uh, we'll come. We'll get you off that one." So he switched me to another tricyclic, which was amitriptyline, and uh, I was only and on you that. Didn't take off? No, you, didn't take them. you no. just you just went straight out, just put you it on was, a different drug and took you off the one that, you, yeah, yeah, it was a straight swap without any tapering, yeah. And uh, I was only mm. on it for about a month, and you know, I tried to taper off of that, and uh, yeah, this is when this whole started, yeah. Did you, did you get, did your PSSD come on as soon as he switched you, or did you get it once you tapered off the second one? Once I tapered off the second one was when I started to realize. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like your story, Emily. Kind of. 
Yeah, so I was on citalopram for at various doses for about four years from age 17 to 22. Um, and then I did taper off as instructed by a doctor. I, I decided to come off it because I was having sexual side effects that were interfering in my relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and about two weeks into the taper, I just woke up one morning and I could feel something in my body had fundamentally changed. There was kind of a cold sensation in my vagina. And I very quickly realized all sexual sensation is completely gone from my body. And I don't have the same level of tactile sensation in my genitals anymore. And, and I could feel that my emotions weren't normal either. I, I had a limited range of emotion compared to what I'd been experiencing even the day before. And I've since in the four years since coming off that antidepressant, I've experienced a little bit of regrowth in the like cognitive functioning and emotions but my sexuality is still 100% gone i i have no uh difference in sensation in my uh, my privates versus like the back of my hand or my elbow and so i yeah it's been 4 years for me and i've been speaking publicly about my experience for about the last two and a half years and it was for yours just to clarify it was literally right after you stopped. So you tapered it, and then it, it was, was off. In, yeah, it was in like the two weeks, about uh, right, almost exactly at the two week mark um, when I started tapering off. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy to me. And did you have sexual side effects? Like, what kind of sexual side effects did you have on the drug compared to? That's lower and like lowered intensity of attraction. So, like, it was just kind of putting a damper on my romantic relationships. Um, and I think it had contributed to at least one breakup. And so I was like, I don't want to spend, I, like I whatever other mental health things I have to deal with, I don't want to spend my adult life on these drugs. I want to have normal relationships. And so I tried to come off for that reason. And that's Fire. when the real problem started. Yeah. Like, um, and were you able to have an orgasm on the medication? Yeah. Yeah. It was just harder. Yeah. See, so like I feel like so I just wanted to get you to speak like kind of similar to Carlton your stories kind of match up there whereas I've spoken to Sean multiple times about this I feel like our stories are very 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 similar mm -hmm. me personally I took fluvoxamine which is Luvox in 2017 only took for like six weeks but didn't have any side effects at all nothing I had it was like a sugar pill. It didn't help at all. I was prescribed it for OCD. It did nothing. It did absolutely nothing for my OCD. It just didn't do anything. Um, so then I just decided I just stopped it. Like I didn't even think too much about it. I just kind of forgot to take it because it was just not doing anything. Fast forward like three years later to 2020, I took Lexapro. And within the first day of taking Lexapro, like instant, just I just felt like an instant switch went off. It was like so mm -hmm. profound. No one believed me. None of the doctors, everyone I spoke to was kind of like, you've only taken like, you know, a couple of days. You need to wait it out. You need to wait a week. You need to wait two weeks. You need to wait. But for me, I feel like it kicks. It's like something changed immediately. But I was just kind of told if you just wait eight weeks, you'll you know, it'll go away. Or if it doesn't go away, we'll try a different drug. And if that doesn't work, we'll just get you off them all together. Like the confidence that this psychiatrist had, that this was just like a temporary thing was just on another level. And then, yeah, basically I only took it for four and a half months and it, it never went away, but my symptoms started on the medication. So I was instantly, I had instant genital numbness instantly unable to have an orgasm at all um like just gradually lost kind of like a tactile sensation it was very weird like I couldn't mentally it was all blocked off it was kind of like having like a spinal block or something it was just not not normal and then yeah I kind of just just trusted the professionals I was like that's gonna go away it didn't go away I've been here this is now like I don't know three years off this drug and it feels like I took my last dose this morning because of how like fresh the side of, they don't feel like side effects, but like the symptoms feel, it just feels mm -hmm. like. It feels very fresh. 
Yeah. It feels like I took the tablet this morning. Like that's, that's how mm-hmm. I feel like people are not understanding because people are not used to things being permanent. So mm. like when things last this long in people's logical minds, they think, oh, it's been a couple of years. It's kind of like transitions get better. No, like how I feel today is exactly how I feel, how I felt, sorry, on December 7th, 2020, which was the last time I took that drug. And yeah, it's just crazy. So mine basically happened on the medication. So you can get it on the medication. You can get off like when you stop. And Sean is very strong. Yeah, yeah, my- during withdrawal or after withdrawal? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My story is very similar to Rosie's. Like mine was, I took Prozac in 2020 for anxiety. I guess you could also say OCD. And then I had absolutely no side effects on it. Um, it didn't really seem to help either. It was just kind of like, like you said, I was taking a sugar pill. Um, it didn't did seem to do anything. It just wasn't the right medication for me, I thought. So I stopped taking it after like three and a half months. And then um, I just didn't bother taking anything else for a while. And then like fast forward about two years later, um, it was when I went back again because my anxiety was getting pretty bad again. And then I asked for something else. And my psychiatrist gave me um, Celexa, I guess, citalopram. And then, you know, within an hour of taking the pill, like I felt the genital numbness set in. That was like the very first symptom. And that was when I was like, oh, I didn't know this was a thing. So I looked it up and it said it was. And, you know, I tried to be calm for a little bit. And then I started to feel like really weird as if like I was losing like thoughts. Like I couldn't really think straight. And then my emotions were kind of just going. And then I just kind of like panicked. Eventually I went to sleep and then the next day I woke up, like everything was pretty much mute. Like that's how it felt. Everything was gone. Um, Music became a sound. I couldn't really like feel anything anymore. And then it's literally been the same thing since then. I've seen no improvement. Um, You know, you get used to it after a while though. So it's like, as much as you don't want to get used to this, you kind of just learn to live with it um, until there's something. But yeah, that's kind of my situation. So it's very similar to yours, Rosie. Yeah. And like, when you say get used to it, like you we kind of have just, to, but we you, kind of, yeah, you to. have to, but it's like, yeah. you're not, you're not living. Like your life is literally destroyed. As long as you have these symptoms, you can't enjoy anything. You just like, you just kind of learn to accept it for now, but it's just not something I could just accept that this is how my life is going to be forever. Like yeah. I can just say, look, this is how it is now. This is horrible but we need to find a way of fixing this. But it's, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of, you do kind of, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 just horrible. It <laughs> like, is, I, yeah. I personally feel like I'm not used to it. Like, but. I don't I guess, think we'll ever actually get completely used to it, but it's something we just had to adapt with for now until there's like more that comes out. And like, as much as we don't want to do that, like if we were to not get used to this, like I don't know where I would be right now, honestly. Like, mm-hmm. We, it's kind of something that we had to do. We were forced. You can't get you can't get used to seeing the opposite gender and fe- not feeling attraction. You know, it's you, exactly yeah. You're yeah. Never used to that because I remember, you mm-hmm. know, going through puberty and I had you know I had those intense feelings, and you mm-hmm. know after developing yeah. sexual side effects and having that you know that those sex that sexual like blunt sexuality just blunted. It's oh. just. For sure, yeah. You don't. You never get used to that. It's it's tra- It's traumatizing every day. Nobody should have to get used to it, but it's the fact that like, like, how are you gonna push through this for years until there's something? It's like you just have to force yourself to push through it every day. Yeah, I I totally agree. It's like there's a part of you that's always gonna be missing for as long as you have this, and it kind of drains the rest of your personality to such an incredible degree. I, I feel like I've just been flattened out like so many aspects of myself have lost a dimension because I no longer have the dimension of my sexuality um, but yeah at the same time I've kind of learned to compartmentalize so that I can survive day to day but obviously it's not how I want to be forever and I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy same I feel like I'm going to jump straight into our questions um do you feel like this has stunted your development into adulthood? Because we all kind of got put on this really, like, you know, like early adulthood. Yeah, it's like I, I, I worry about 
because you know you hear so many things about these drugs and how they stunt you know they can affect puberty you know i was put on 15 emily was 17 it you know you have those thoughts in your head in the back of your head like what how has this stunted my growth how has they stunted my sexual development it's uh it's really difficult but those thoughts are always with me every day yeah i would personally say i just don't feel like i ever hit like the milestones that i was supposed to mentally hit when i went through like just just even turn from because I got this at age 20. So just like just just little things like just being able to have a normal relationship. I feel like from the age of like 17 to maybe 26, I feel like that's such a critical window of like just self-development and just like understanding your own sexuality and just how you are in relationships and stuff. And to have that like literally just completely wiped I just don't feel like an adult sometimes I feel like a prepubescent child because mm. I don't have my sexuality like I feel like like a little kid and I know that a lot of people don't have a sex drive and they're on the medication like and they're, they're just kind of accepting that but I didn't I don't think you know this is like a good idea to be completely blunting out someone's entire sexuality which is so core to their identity I just really think that I would have been a completely different person like if I just didn't take these medications like I would have been able to travel I just think now of all the things I would have been able to do and like I just didn't I wasn't thinking that at the time I was just following the guidance of others and what they thought but like now thinking about it I look at where my friends are at and I just feel kind of like ahead in some ways because like of I've had to mature so much just from having this. I've just had to grow up. But then also I feel like I've just missed out on so much that I feel like I just don't relate to a lot of people anymore. I totally get that. That's kind of how I am too. Like I still try to be the person I was before this all happened to me. And I still hang out with like my friends and stuff. And it's really hard to put on that personality that I had before. But I try my best to because I don't want to be known as like the new the new person I am now so mm -hmm. it's it is really draining to try and put up that fake persona when you can't feel anything like even like when I'm going out and drinking like there's no nothing from alcohol I can't feel a single thing so I'm just sitting there and I'm like pretending to laugh and have fun but I'm just sitting there in like that blank like no thought cycle as always like there's no dopamine involved no serotonin nothing like it's just everything's empty yeah Oh, yeah, I, I know that I know people who have gotten PSSD in their 30s, you know, and it just it it speaks to me that if people can develop this condition, well, you know, their brains have been fully developed, you know, your brain stops developing at 25. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, if, if they take a drug and they still develop the syndrome, what does that say for putting children on this? It's, uh, you know, it, I just think, because I, you know, I, I, I feel like I, my sexuality was all right on the medicine. You know, I feel like I, I went through that puberty, you know, I had those feelings and then, you know, to, for that to be blunted, it's like, it's just crazy. And, you know, you think of, like I say, people that are in their thirties, their forties that can get this condition. And then you think, you know, we're, we're putting 15 year olds on these drugs. It's... It can happen at any age. It can happen from one pill. It can happen from a thousand pills. Like, but what I don't understand as well, is like, I feel like so many times when I bring this up with like a medical professional, say for example, because I don't know about that. You, um, I think Emily and I kind of got this like first, but the gaslighting even like three years ago was unbelievable. So like even bring like just the downright denial that this exists and, you know, like you bring up with your doctor that my libido is literally shot. Like I can't actually feel anything properly. I can't, I can't even feel sexual pleasure like on my own, like something is most definitely wrong. And they say, you know, like it can be depression that causes this, depression causes this. And like, if people knew that they give these drugs to pedophiles to block le their libido, I'm sure that maybe they I would. about that actually? I was like, about, what is this? 
Yeah, they give SSRIs. Even the Royal College of Psychiatrists was posting about it on Twitter. I remember give- reading that and I was like, that's, yeah. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. So it's like you're giving me a drug that's potent enough to block the libido of a pedophile, which is like the most just disgusting, deviant, sexual person on this planet. You're giving that drug to me. Like it's going to affect my libido more than likely. Like they even know not just, everything. Yeah. Like even not just the denial of the symptoms either, but even if they will admit that these symptoms can happen either on or off the drug, they there's a, a minimization. Like a line I got over and over from different medical professionals was there's more to life than sex. Yeah, same. You know, like you are, it's like just returning to the concept of how does it impede your growth into adulthood? Like when you are dulling the sexuality of a teenager, um, they're not obviously not going to form relationships the same way someone who didn't have that happen to them would. Um, like I had, I had a active sexuality but I'd never been in any kind of sexual relationship when I was 17 I only started doing that afterwards when I was already on the drug so I had nothing to compare it to Mm. you know I didn't I hadn't had the experience of a sexual relationship not on SSRIs and then uh, then I realized by comparing myself to like others something something's wrong and then I tried to get off them and I lost my sexuality entirely at the age of 23 like it's just I can't believe that a medical professional of all people, and especially someone like a youth psychiatrist, which is who I was seeing, would not appreciate how tremendously that's going to impact the development of a personality. Mm, I agree. I agree with that. And like the fact that, you know, a lot of people with PSSD are also missing their emotions. So like that and like the emotions, like you're taking away all functions of a human, like, you are leaving them just lifeless at that point. Like some people- I feel like everything that people pleasure seek for, so like when people go out and they have heaps of sex or they do heaps of drugs, all of that is to get a feeling, like they're chasing a feeling. But when you have PSSD, you cannot feel that. It is like physiologically shut off. So like these are all the things that people kind of like, not even just pleasure seeking but just enjoying stuff listening to music I can't listen to music anymore it does not sound the same like it sounds like it's like screeching through my headphones it's not it's not like a nice like enveloping sound it's just horrible it's like yeah it just feels like like I'm not processing it properly in my brain anymore on top of that you know you can't just come home from work and you know enjoy like a normal sex life no and then if you do bring that up you're made to feel like oh my god get over it like no one has that like think your whole life's not about your sex life get over it I think it's just like because people don't know how to respond to that so they're just like oh get over it but for you yeah. like I think any normal person could could understand just how horrible this would be and I think you'd have to be quite lacking in imagination to not be able to understand like how bad this would be mm-hmm. but moving on to my um next question is there anything that triggers you really really badly since you got PSSD like any little thing that maybe you didn't have before but now it's just because I feel like sexuality is everywhere especially in our culture it's literally in every single thing that we do implicit or explicit it's everywhere i'll just go first um i try not to let like other people trigger me by a whole lot because i know like everybody has their own opinion whatever they want but um in general though like i do feel myself getting angry at a lot of things um at the beginning of pssd like i was irritable 24 7 because i couldn't process the loss of emotions and sexual function so I kind of just like lived life angry all the time. I didn't want to be associated with anybody. Um, I didn't want to talk to anybody. That lasted for months and months on end. And then it finally started to get a little bit better. But sometimes I do feel myself still getting angry a lot just because I still have a hard time processing the grief that comes with PSSD. 
um, because I, again, like we can't actually get used to this, but we have to try to force ourselves to just keep moving forward all the time. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, think I think probably you know many things trigger me. I'd say just seeing uh, I don't know like a young couple with a child, for example. You know, just say like I'm just walking in town, I see them, and I'm just like, you're just reminded of you know, is this going to be able to happen for me one day? Um, will I get those, that experience? Will I get that, you know, happiness, which comes from a partnership, you know, from having a child? Um, you know, that's one thing that definitely triggers me, I'd say. Just, yeah, like you say, it's everywhere. You know, it's really hard to to get through it. You know, it's you can watch a movie, you know, and you might have to turn the movie off because you might get triggered or, you know, you might be listening to one of your favorite songs and then you remember that all oh, this is about you know love and sex and then you know it all just comes back again it's uh it's really everywhere you know it's 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 kind of it's just hard to avoid you can't you can't escape the condition because it you know it's everywhere in this one society yes it really is yeah same for me same as what um sean and carlton mentioned and then also because for me, it happened so immediately and it was when I woke up once in the morning, sometimes I'll still like wake up in the morning and suddenly for no other reason, just be hit with this incredible feeling of dread yep. because I'm kind of reliving that moment of waking up and realizing something was terribly wrong. Like I, I just feel like I'm constantly on the precipice of something horrible happening to me. I have that every day, even this morning when I first woke up. I I also noticed, like, I don't – this is a really weird observation, but I feel like I can't relax in my own body because I feel so incredibly uncomfortable. I don't even awesome. sleep in the same position. I used to sleep with, like, my hands under the pillow and, like, one leg out. and like, you know, I was just really comfy. But now I'm just, like, I kind of just sleep like this because I'm so uncomfortable and I just don't, like, like – it, it is kind of like a trauma response and I'm not just saying that like you know to sound like a sook or something but I've noticed there are times where I'm talking about PSSD normally especially to people that are like willing to listen and I'll just start involuntarily shaking and I can't control it I've never been like that ever even when I've had severe anxiety no one would ever have known like I was very like chill I have a very like sunny disposition but I just noticed myself like shaking and I'm realizing like, oh my God, like it's, it's kind of like a weird, it's always when people are willing to listen as well. It's like, I feel like I'm finally able to talk about it, but it still like freaks me out. And even just little things like I notice I get really tricky. This is really weird, but like in the supermarket, when you see like couples together, and, like, especially if you go like later at night, it's just such a normal part of life that you realize has been completely stripped of you like just being able to go and get food with your partner and then cook something for dinner and then just have like a normal just you know like some people like hold hands or like they're just showing like physical affection in the most like modest way but something like that really does something to me because I've realized like even if I wanted to have that, I can't feel anything. Like something has been shut off in my brain and it just makes me like so, as you said, Sean, like angry that that was stripped of me without my consent. Like had I have known, had any of us known, we were going to be permanently chemically castrated from taking these medications. We would never have taken them. We exactly. all took these drugs with the promise that we are in full control of the side effects. And if it, if it, gets too much all we have to do is stop taking the drug that is just a total lie and it couldn't be further from the truth some of us have gotten worse just from stopping the drug I feel like uh, since stopping my symptoms have progressed and progressed and progressed as well but there are just so many little things that trigger me very very normal like normal things trigger me or like hearing about as you said Carlton like you know if someone I know is pregnant it makes me think like you know, I don't know if I could ever, like, I don't know if that'll ever happen to me. Like, it just, yeah, it just makes you think so much about what's happened to you and, like, just how, I know there's no such thing as being behind in life, but just because we never got to, like, 
consolidate our normal sexual development you just feel like I don't know what I'm going to do with my life like I just keep going forward I'll just keep doing what I want to do but we like we need help like we need like gynecologists urologists and neurologists to all be looking into this because this is really 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 important like you know uh, genital numbness and like loss of your ability to have an orgasm and like just complete sexual dysfunction has to be up there with some of the worst side effects you could possibly have. And then to think that that's just now permanent is like an absolute disaster. Yeah. It's yeah, the fact like that we're not told about it either. Like it just, it's so no. right wrong in so many ways. Yeah. Like it's a scandal. What else could you call that? If they're not listing the side effect on the label, they're not telling you about it and you can't like find anything about it until you actually Google it. And you're like, oh, well, I was yeah. screwed over and now there's no coming back. There's no treatment. So it's like, yeah. And then all of our efforts, you know, we've tried contacting like in Australia, the TGA, they don't do anything about it. The FDA, we submitted a citizen's petition in like 2018 before I even had PSSD. They still haven't replied, even though they are like, you know, they have to reply in a timely matter. They never replied. The MHRA have done absolutely nothing. Health Canada made like one little statement. That's pretty much and that it. Was but- after them for months like I cannot tell you how many hours of my life I expended trying to wring from them that one little acknowledgement Mm -hmm. and to think like if you take a medication that's that's the protection you have that's it like you know I kind of almost had and I was speaking to another sufferer about this but in the back of my head I decided you know to take these drugs with the belief ingrained in the back of my head that if something was really this bad the regulators wouldn't allow this to happen to its citizens. Like governments would protect people from shit like this, but no, they don't. They do not care. Even if you're in the prime of your life, we're all in our prime. Early twenties is your prime of your life. It's just being completely obliterated by these drugs. And it feels like a yeah. betrayal. It feels like a betrayal. It is. It, oh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. When I was, uh, I, I was watching the, uh, the BBC panorama recently did a, you know, a special on antidepressants and PSSD was in there. And when I, when I learned that the MHRA had known about this since the eighties, the 1980s, I just felt completely betrayed by my own like government, you know, healthcare system. It's, you know, I I just, because on a piece of paper, this is the way I see it on a piece of paper, they look at it and they think about, they try and weigh up the risks and the benefits. They, they think, you know, if we're going to be treating people's mental health, there are going to be a few things that go wrong. Like that's to be expected. That's how healthcare kind of works. They're not thinking about this logically. Like you are putting people at risk of permanent chemical castration. People don't, you don't just get chemically castrated and go, oh, well, I'll just learn to live with it. It literally destroys your life. It's caused, I don't even know how many people to commit suicide. If you don't die, you're left just like hanging there, yeah. Hanging by a thread to try and get through and battling to get through every day. It's not an acceptable risk to take without informing someone. And you know, I was told I could have a low libido on the drug or difficulty having an orgasm. I never consented to losing all sensation in my genitals. Like what the nobody fuck is that? Would. They don't even know why SSRIs cause genital numbness. Like they don't even know what that mechanism is. They don't know if it's like neuropathy. They don't know if it's like disturbed sodium channels. They don't know if it's something. They have no idea. They've never even looked into it. And that is like, you know, even David Healy said close to 100% of people get it as soon as you start taking the drug, but they've never even looked into it. Like it's unbelievable. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I wasn't even informed about the temporary side effects. I was a teenager going on these drugs. No one even told me that I could experience temporary sexual dysfunction. I discovered that on my own after experiencing it and then Googling it. Yeah. But she didn't discuss with me once until I brought it up. Some of the doctors here just know. throw the pills out too. Like after a good 10 or 15 minutes or so in the doctor's office, they'll just be like, okay, here you go. Like, they just kind of send you off and then it's your job to read the leaflet but on that leaflet there's no mention of permanent anhedonia or permanent sexual dysfunction it's just kind of like okay you may experience sexual dysfunction it doesn't list genital numbness from my understanding but 
either way, there's still like two or three side effects that are missing off that leaflet. It needs to be in the special warnings and precautions. Like it needs to be, and I know people say, oh, but that's that's only for really important things. Like if if this isn't like alarming, I don't know what is. Like the, the anhedonia, apart from just the sexual problem, because that's that's one piece of the pie. The anhedonia is the most unbelievable thing that I just cannot describe. Like it just feels like I've got like earplugs in constantly. Like my whole world is completely on mute, as you said, Sean. Like it's like a TV on mute. Know. Like you're still seeing it and everything, but you're not feeling any of it, or like you're not understanding or listening to any of it. It's like you can't really get anything out of life anymore. So you're just it's witnessing exactly it. what it's like. Not is perfect. literal TV on mute. You're and not I, I just go through the motions, but this is not like how are you supposed to have a meaningful life like this? You literally can't. You don't. Um, I just want to go on to our next question because I don't want to waste too much time. But um, you know, like, how does it make you feel when other people tell you that these medications saved their life and it comes at the expense of ruining yours? Um, I can go first. I think when people say that, like, I'm happy that they're doing better, and like, I'm really glad that like their lives are changing for the better but you have to look at both sides of things and a lot of the time people like to look at the positives and outweigh the negatives but something that comes with PSSD is that the negative with PSSD is so big that if this ever happens to you you will probably never be the same and you will regret every second you took in making that decision and like obviously I'm not trying to steer people away from drugs like that like I know they really help people and stuff like that but there's other people that really get harmed by these and then they're just kicked to the dust because nobody wants to listen to that like like it, oh if like i'm doing better then like i don't care about your experience because like it's helping me so i don't care like i don't know i just this think it's really different. dangerous is we've had so many people in our community like i've spoken to countless people that were kind of like that even recently in girl i spoke she was very pro ssris helped her a lot helped her ocd i think it was a lot anxiety everything and she just really couldn't understand when people were talking about all these negative things. She was just like, that wasn't, that didn't reflect her experience at all. She had a very, very positive experience. It helped to fix up her life. However, after discontinuing the drug, I think it was like a couple of months after she crashed and instantly, same as you, Emily, woke up one day, completely numb genitals, couldn't feel anything at all when she was peeing, like just anhedonia and all of these symptoms have persisted now for like two two years or more after stopping the drug yeah. and it's like even the people that are really advocating for these drugs can get harmed by them like you're not that there's no I know there's going to be so many people that will take multiple SSRIs that will just never get this it's just probably not genetically you know they're probably just genetically not susceptible mm -hmm. to it but there are so many people who are going to end up like this, whether it's from the very first drug you take, you might be so confident in SSRIs. You're like, I'll try another one and another one. I've seen so many posts on Reddit of people being like, you know, I was on four SSRIs and I was completely fine. And then I took an SNRI and now I have full blown PSSD or they have, you know, two SNRIs and they take an SSRI and then they have PSSD or people that take, you know, three or I've seen up to like six, pe like, you know, people taking five SSRIs, six of them. And then on the last one, they get full blown PSSD. Like you just don't know if this is going to happen to you when it's going to happen to you. And it's like, without any treatment available, like this is just, this just needs to be addressed. If people are going to continue to use these drugs, like this is just so unsafe oh, you're essentially playing russian roulette like that's kind of yeah. how it is with this you do not you don't know when it's going to happen if it ever will happen even if it's like a one percent chance like it doesn't matter like if you get this you will regret every moment you took like that's kind of how it's going to work that's how we all feel yeah, yeah. That's and I feel. Think for people for people like me you know who who weren't put on the drugs for depression anxiety you know was was the stomach problem really worth this? No, it wasn't at all. And for people that get put on them for pain, for premenstrual syndrome, 
you know, we all of us, we all look back and think we all we all wish we just knew about what could happen, you know, because we didn't we didn't really need to take these drugs, but we got given them anyway. Yeah. And I think life. even like even the issue that I have is with a lot of psychiatrists I've seen, especially on Twitter, is even if they can't deny the existence of PSSD anymore, they just like gloss over it. Like, oh, you know, yes, PSSD is very real. It can happen, but it's very rare, guys. Like, don't be alarmed. It's totally fine. And then they go into like this spiel where they come up with all of this BS that they've read on the internet of what we can give you is bupropion and bupropion is a noradrenaline dopamine reuptake inhibitor and that can fix PSSD. So they're kind of setting up this false sense of security of like, if you do get this, we have plenty of options for you. Not realizing like the patient doesn't realize if you do get this, there isn't actually, we don't even, first of all, know why SSRIs cause genital numbness. And then secondly, like we have no we have no treatment for this direct treatment that is going to work for everyone. I've seen multiple cases of people trying bupropion and getting windows of improvement. And I've seen people crashing from it so badly that they've never recovered. There's so definitely a defensiveness that will come up when you're talking to someone who has been on SSRIs or is on them and has benefited from them. Um, or even just like has a family member on them because they feel like you are criticizing their decision by talking about what happened to you. And I think we should, like we on one hand have to make it clear that we're not trying to shame them or pass judgment on their uh, decisions, but we had the right to make an informed decision for ourselves. Everyone should have the information required to actually make an informed decision. And none of us had any way of knowing that we could get PSSD. Um, and I think they they also need to recognize that we're not some acceptable sacrifice so that other people can benefit. We don't have to shut up about our experiences just because somebody else felt that their life was improved by medication. We have every right to talk about what happened to our lives and our bodies. Um, and at the end of the day, we're not the ones who have an enormous platform. People who have benefited from SSRIs have a big platform. Um, Nobody, I, I don't see anyone these days in mainstream society shutting them down or, or subjecting them to undue criticism, whereas we have to fight every day to be heard if we want our message to get out to people. Mm. Yeah, I, I've seen, yeah, that especially on Twitter. Mm. It's like, you know, people, people are congratulated for seeking help for their mental health, but if you get like completely screwed over by the medication that you take you're just put in like the too hard basket and it's just like oh well bad luck most people benefit so you're just like you're just a s insignificant statistic on yeah. a piece of paper like you, your life is worth nothing like you're just a sacrifice so that we can all live a bit better and it's like it, it kind of I also don't like as well how I just think there's something so evil about the fact that these pharmaceutical companies are like pitting people against each other of pro SSRIs versus not anti SSRIs, but people that have been harmed. Like there's something just so sinister about that where I've gotten into arguments with people that I would normally be like really friendly with or friends with, because it's just this complete like misunderstanding and like, there's this narrative of we have to destigmatize mental health. We have to, you know, make these SSRIs out to be these amazing things so that if people want to seek help, that they can have access to them. And it's like, it's not that people don't have access to them. People just need to be told, do you want to continue with this? Because it is your choice. Yeah. Like we're not here to stigmatize. We're here to just tell the truth about what happened to us. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah, I'm just going to say like real quick, we were in the same boat as those people who were seeking out mental health treatments. Like, we're mm -hmm. all in that same situation. So it's like, we're not against them in any way because we did the same thing that they did. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up being like a really like harmed, like part of that treatment. So instead of just hiding it and like letting other people get harmed, we want to tell them what's actually happening. And like, even if it's like a lower chance, it's still gonna, it can still happen to anybody, I think.
And not that this would be an acceptable injury to happen to anyone at any point in their life, but we're all so young. Like Mm -hmm. we have, you know, if the average life expectancy is, you know, up until your mid eighties, like we have so many years left on this earth. Like I do not want to be dealing with this for the rest of my life. Like we deserve treatment, even though this is probably the worst time in your life to get this because this is where you know in your 20s and 30s even 40s is when like this stuff matters the most but like I think sexuality is important throughout like all stages of life like I don't think anyone should ever be left chemically castrated ever like at any point and I just think I just really hope that researchers are going to understand how many young people have this I've spoken to David Healy even about how many people he's been contacted by parents that have committed suicide. And like, even, I don't know, it kind of hit me the other day um, with the PSSD network. We had like quite a big donation um, of a mother whose son committed suicide because of this. And it just made me think like, like, this is not, this is not just some like Twitter argument. Like this is actually people's lives. Like this is, this is really serious. It's not just some like conspiracy, whatever, like people are dying because of this. People are harming themselves. People are injecting themselves with the most, excuse my language, but I'm not going to go there, but like it's just the most messed up stuff that they buy on the internet to do anything to relieve the symptoms. I actually know of someone who started injecting himself with all these hormones to see if that helps because there's no people are harming themselves because there's, there's no like actual medical science or medical research that's helping these people. And it's really messed up. It's so dangerous. Like people are so desperate. They will try literally anything even, you know, I've seen so many posts on our Reddit of people taking up the use of like methamphetamine because they cannot feel anything. Like meth is literally the only thing that might give them a little window in their anhedonia. Even for some people that have really severe PSSD, it doesn't even work at all. Like to think that meth doesn't even work on your brain anymore once you have this, like that's just, I don't even, I don't even know what to say about that. Like it's just insanity, but people are putting themselves in such harmful situations, young people. And then if not that suicide and like, that is a scar that like doesn't ever leave a family. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do is to get research and treatments to prevent people from literally killing themselves because of this disease. And I hope that people can see us as like, we're actually advocating for people to be safer we don't want to take these SSRIs away from people like I understand there are so many people who feel that these drugs have like really benefited their life even if we ripped everyone like not that it would ever be in our power but I don't understand that argument of like we're trying to take SSRIs away from people because even if we took everyone in the world off these drugs that doesn't fix PSSD like we just want treatment for this condition and I feel like we also want to give the gift of informed consent to people because it was something that we so desperately wish that we had. (laughs) Yeah, we're not we're not trying to take SSRIs away, but I do think, you know, especially here in the UK, there is definitely malpractice going on with how these drugs are uh, prescribed, you know, how frequently they're prescribed, probably for issues that don't really need them. So Mm I'll give you an example. So um, one of my family members, for example, all right, is uh, just been, you know, going through a, like a normal life problem, you know, just stress with work issues, you know, and um, they thought, okay, well, I'll go to a GP and see if I can get some counseling, you know, to try and help with the problem of, you know, of, of the stress of life, you know, because we all go through stress, right? And, um, you know, so she goes to the, the GP and, she books an appointment she goes and within two minutes of the appointment she's offered ssris you know we'll give you these why would you need ssris for you know a problem because i think they're like made out to be really mild 
Like, I don't think people understand how potent these drugs are for a lot of people. They're kind of made out to be like these really mild anxiety drugs. You just take one a day and it kind of just keeps you level. But in actual fact, like when I took this drug, this was like, and I'm not exaggerating, like the most powerful drug I have ever taken in my life. <laughs> like it had the most profound effect on me. It's not a mild thing for a lot of people. These drugs can make you feel so different to how you would usually feel. And even for a lot of people, that state of complete just indifference can make you suicidal. Like mm. that's a whole other can of worms is what else these drugs can cause. But I just think, yeah, they're not mild drugs. I think that needs to be like removed out of some doctor's you brains. You don't need them for work stress, right? You don't need them for normal life things. You don't need them for going through, I don't know, like a breakup. You know, you see people prescribe these things for breakups. You don't, you don't need to blunt your emotions because you're feeling sadness or, you know, it's a normal, it's a normal thing in life to have to go through. You know, it's part of life. You know, people, people past generations when they went through these things, didn't, you know, didn't blunt their emotions because of these reasons, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's perfectly normal to experience grief in life and have a problem. You don't need to seek these things out and, you know, I think definitely um, the rate of which they're prescribed for these kinds of problems really needs to be looked at. It is. I, I also agree that it would. it's a massive, like, malpractice issue, especially, like, a lot of young kids and uni students being put on it for, like, oh, know, yeah. like yeah. school stress, school stress, and, like, just the stresses that come with, like, being in uni or college, like, the first few years, but... You know, I guess the counter argument for that would be people would say, well, if there's something that works and it's helping me, why shouldn't I take it? And it's like, like, by all means, if something helps you, like, go ahead and take it. But I guess that's kind of the mindset that I had <laughs> going into it was like, well, if it's going to help me, why shouldn't I take it? Well, because you just don't know what other facet of your life this drug could completely destroy. <laughs> So just keep in mind, it's not, these drugs are not without risks. Like they can be really life-changing in the, in a good way or in a horrible way. It's really a roll of the dice. You just don't know what you're going to get. But the issue is once you get PSSD, there's no going back. Like you are either going to have to wait it out for months or years on end and be waiting for the tiniest bit of improvement, you know, like, I just, it almost makes me laugh at how many PSSD sufferers, like, they're like, oh, I had, you know, a little bit more emotions today. Like, we are scraping at the bottom of the barrel just to feel anything. We're so desperate. That's how it feels. We're just so desperate to feel like even the slightest bit of emotion. That it'll just, it's kind of like, here, we're going to give you a drug. It probably won't fix what you're going through, but it's going to make you realize how good everything in your life was before you took it. For like, sure. That's how I feel anyway. But yeah, what we dealt with before PSSD was nothing compared to this. Like, okay. I will go back to what I had any day. But yeah. Same. But um, I just wanted to go on my last question, which was how has this affected your self-esteem and self-confidence, especially having this around this age? I think it's tough like for me I felt like my self-esteem just was completely shattered as soon as I got this like your self-confidence just is obliterated because you just you just apart from the fact that you don't feel human anymore you just feel like I don't feel good enough like I just feel like like, I just feel like I'm a burden now. Like, I don't feel, I just feel like I'm a patient. I don't even feel like I would be a partner. And I've heard this from multiple people, even people in relationships. And I know people say, oh, you can find someone really understanding. Oh, I just, it's so, it's it's almost impossible to keep a relationship going like this. Yeah. Like, it, you can't feel anything, even emotionally. Like, if you're that emotionally blunted, you can't even feel like love attraction it's like without that it's just a friendship i'm sorry but it is it's just a friendship yeah. without that. So <clears> i just I, think especially 
yeah being young and it's yeah I totally get that yeah like I have like no esteem whatsoever like I can't even feel that like I can't feel anything to even experience that so it's like I just feel like I'm at the lowest of the barrel and I've been like that since day one of PSSD and like we said earlier it feels like we're taking the pill like every single day still so mm-hmm. it just feels the exact same as it did from day one and that's mm-hmm. kind of just how I've been so we just no changes mm-hmm. yeah I just I just feel like I've been and Sean you'll probably be able to agree with me here as a guy I just feel totally demasculated um oh for sure yeah I have to avoid like I avoid girls now because like I know like if I were to get into a situation it would it would not be a good outcome because I have to lie because I'm still not comfortable telling people about like this whole condition like my friends and stuff so it's like how are you going to tell a random girl this or like just a girl that you're talking to about this it's going to sound weird right like who I don't know that's just I think you know as guys are masculinity is um it's very entwined with our sexual you know sexuality right so yeah exactly Exactly. when we're with friends you know and we have to like try and put up a wall and say you know if they say like oh how are you dating anyone or you know and you're having those conversations you know you're having to kind of block yeah i've had that you're kind of there with them but you don't feel a part of it you know you you can't can't feel a part of it because you you want to be you know you want I want to date you know I want to you know we're in our 20s we're all in our 20s right we want to be having fun we want to be making memories and um for sure you know, to to sit there and 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 be like oh yeah I've got numb thinking I've got numb genitals you know my arousal response is like 10 10 percent of what I, it was. I, I don't even explain that I'm just like oh yeah I've just been like really busy I I can't like you know, I don't have time for that right now. But in reality, it's just because like I have no emotions, no sensation like there. So how's that gonna how's that gonna work? It's it's impossible. So mm. yeah, I totally get that. Emily. As far as like confidence and self-esteem go, I just feel like that's not even a relevant question to me anymore because I just completely set aside all attempts at like self-actualization and thriving and my life has just been so focused on daily survival like just kind of I I dropped I had to drop out of school because like the stress of trying to live with this condition and some of the like brain fog that came with it was just too much to deal with um so just just kind of getting a very slow-paced job and like like, I don't even, I don't even think about self-esteem because I don't really feel like I have a self. Like, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just keeping myself stable. And that's the extent of my, like, aims at this point in my life, which is sad for someone in their 20s. Um, but I also find that either speaking about PSSD or not speaking about PSSD kind of takes a toll on my self-esteem too, because when I'm not speaking about it, I feel like I'm not advocating and I feel like I'm just kind of letting what was done to me be done to me. Um, and, but when I do speak about it, it's just such an intimate topic that even though I'm glad to talk about it, I feel a little bit violated every time I have to come out and even just like be a part of a video or, or, or discuss it publicly or, or even talk to a new doctor about it. And it does slowly just kind of wear away at me and make me feel deeply kind of small and tired. Mm, I feel that definitely, especially like every time we kind of have to talk about it, it is kind of like humiliating. Like it's like you have, you chemically castrated me and now I have to face like anxiety and depression was not even a problem compared to this whatever I experienced of it and I had pretty bad depression at the time and anxiety but to think of like you know I was worried about little things in my life that were completely in my control in hindsight now every day we face being publicly humiliated ridiculed I'm just like yep whatever give it to me like we just there's no way out of this you have to like literally like run through fire to get out of this and you're just going to get you just have to accept you're going to get so burnt in trying to fix this but that is literally your only option and I feel like that's what's taken so long for this to be recognized is like this stigma and humiliation of having your genitals literally like 
mutilated. I feel chemically mutilated, like is so like, it just makes it so hard to raise awareness because I struggle to find anyone who wants to speak up about this. Like I've said this before, but like from an evolutionary perspective, sexuality is competitive, like with every species, just about every species. And like, to think like, you know, we have to oust ourselves and be like, you know, I, I'm just not in that game anymore. Like I'm just completely fucked by this whole experience and these drugs. Like, I don't know. I think a lot of people lack, lack empathy for that because they're kind of just like, I don't really know how to explain it. I think, you know what I'm trying to say, Emily, (laughs) you might have a better way of putting this. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of a, well, tough luck sort of thing. Yeah. yeah oh bad luck oh well you know like you you went from having this like confidence and just just like ability to just interact socially and enjoy you know your sexuality or just just you don't understand how much confidence comes from just that part of you until it's completely removed because it's very odd once it's not there like even little things like going out to a bar or something and you're just chatting to people, but you can't feel anything. Like it's completely life ruining. And like, there's been like probably thousands of experiences over the years, not just sexual, but just like emotional or just, just life experiences that I've missed out on because of this, because you just can't feel anything. Yeah, I agree with that. It's almost like you're just talking to a wall whenever you're talking to people. Like there's absolutely no connection. And like towards what Emily was saying about the self-esteem thing, like we don't even have really room for that now because we're kind of just focusing on surviving. Like Mm. our main focus is just survive until hopefully like fingers crossed, we find like a treatment or something in the future because like we're just kind of hanging in. Well, that's why we're making this video because we need people to become aware of how much we're struggling. And like, you know, this is for people, like we are representing thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people that probably have the same thing after taking SSRIs that don't even know what's happened to them because they weren't even informed that this was possible you know like everyone deserves a fair chance and this is just like so unfair like I know life is unfair but this is a whole nother level of unfair and I wouldn't want to see this happen to anyone else like even thinking about my family members and stuff like I'm so glad that this happened to me and like not my brother or someone because the risk of suicide for someone that has this and like is just so high like it would just pain me to think like I think a lot of family members especially siblings really struggle when they know that their sibling has this and they know the complexity and the depth of like how bad this is because you know you don't want to lose anyone in your family and parents that are just on edge all the time about their kid like just there's nothing it's just not fair that there's just no treatment and stuff available so instead of whinging and complaining about it we want to try and change it and just make sure that you know governments take this seriously the medical community takes this very seriously and that people can go to their doctor one day and say I've got you know I took this medication I've got numb genitals and stuff and doctors can be like oh that sounds like this syndrome here is you know, like this is the treatment protocol for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then instead of having to advocate for 15 years of your life just to get a treatment that you can hopefully get that one day in like, you know, an hour (laughs) and then be like on to the next and then get your life back and move on. Like shouldn't be that hard, but I don't know why it is. Um, Yeah, I think there was one more question that I had. Um, You know, just to bump in, actually, um, one thing that really frustrates me about this whole thing is that everyone I've met in this community is such a fantastic person. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed getting to know everyone and learning their stories. It's, yeah, it, I almost like I'm grieving, not just for myself, but for everyone else in this community, because, you know, like I say, everyone, everyone I've met is such a great person, you know, more, and I feel like uh, we're all very ambitious people um i'd say like you know even myself like i'm very i'm happy with other aspects of my life i'm happy with where my you know academic career is heading and 
that regard. So I think that's what, you know, especially makes this hard to deal with the fact that um, what, what can be in the future. So like, I, you know, I can graduate and I can, you know, go, I, my dream is to move abroad, you know, and uh, teach and uh, you know, I've got that, I can do that. But at the end of the day, it's like, I feel like I'm grieving what can be, you know, the, the life of what I can have, you know, but this kind of just, you know, it, it really yeah. affects thing of what, cause you think, what, what can I have? You know, I I've got, you know, I've got this ambition. I've got, you know, I've got the success to want to succeed in my life. And um, it's like you say, it, it's, it's really cruel to have something like this inflicted upon you. It feels like a curse. It genuinely just feels like I'm cursed. It does. It, it does yeah. And everywhere I'm walking, the curse follows me like everywhere that I go people have suggested stuff like you need a holiday you just need to go on a holiday and it's like if I go anywhere in the world like you know I'm in Bali and I still have all of the symptoms it doesn't go away just because you move locations like if you if you're trying to get away from like severe arthritis pain going overseas it's not gonna or maybe for some people it might make you feel a bit better but like you need to treat what's going on like I feel like I've constantly I've got like a ball and chain shackled to like my leg and I cannot move like I'm just stuck and like I guess the most important thing and like they always say like speak up ask for help I feel like I've been screaming out for help for the last like three years and I'm just literally like just echoing into the void like there's just no help is what did this to us I know I wish I never asked for help I feel like it's I am very hesitant about well I don't know like I've I think you all know this but like I when I even asked for help after having PSSD and I was told to see a psychiatrist they didn't even believe me they said that I was delusional and then they sectioned me, put me, and they said my mental health was deteriorating a lot because I was like just extremely like unstable and everything. They got that part right, but I was never delusional. And then they said that I need to be on more antidepressants. Like that is literally a recipe for disaster. And then they gave me drugs that made me worse. So it's like, like that's the help you get. That's literally, that that is not good enough. There is literally no help for people that are being harmed by psychiatry or just harmed by SSRIs in this way. Like there needs to be so much more for people like that. And there are other conditions as well that like, you know, must, must, must be addressed. It's not just PSSD. There are other things that are coming from these medications that are being lost over that, you know, I've like met, as you said, Carlton, like so many amazing people since, um, since you know this whole thing has happened and just hearing their stories and what they've had to go through in terms of like withdrawal and like severe akathisia like these things are so 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 severe they just can't be ignored anymore it's so bad yeah Yeah. um did anyone else want to add anything like let's see i I was just gonna say like like with you and like being sessioned and everything like that is like absolutely insane that they did that and like I'm sorry you had to go through that and like I know most of us like whenever we tell our doctors about this we're also like gaslit and we're told that it's not real or we're told that our mental illness is like coming back but you know a lot of us like some of us weren't even put on the medication for mental illness and like the ones that were a lot of us were either depression or anxiety so it's not like we're delusional people for having anxiety or depression so it's like, I don't understand where you could possibly get that from. And like, I don't know, like my doc, my doctor saw like, like some examples of why I was experiencing this. And like, we did some tests and like some of the stuff looked a little bit off. And like, he still told me that, you know, it's all in your head. Like, don't worry about it. Just here, take this next pill and you'll be fine. And I was like, if I take this next pill. I don't even know like what my outcome would be. And I would really just not want to experience that. So mm-hmm. again, like we're we're all just kind of like thrown away by the doctors and like psychiatrists. And I just think it's really important that this is added into the leaflets and also into um, the books. So upcoming doctors can start to study this and realize that this is a real thing. I think it needs to be more than just um, 
it needs to be more than that. Like I really think that with PSSD, you should have to sign an informed consent leaflet that both the doctor and the patient, they've been through the checklist, you've been informed about this, here, I'll sign here, you sign here, and then we both know we're on the same page about that. Especially because because I don't really have any understanding yet of how common it is. Like the only, there's that recent study out of Israel that suggested that it's approximately one in 216 people who take an SSRI who develop PSSD. Um, But, you know, that's still a lot of people considering there's millions of people on SSRIs. Like that's not actually that uncommon. No, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. What frustrates me the most is, you know, the, the, the fact that, um, you know, someone in our community got a, a reply back from the MHRA yesterday, uh, you know, asking about the issue. And, you know, they basically replied with, oh, you should see a doctor and discuss, discuss with them about that and get your, maybe get your hormones checked. I mean, is they think you know, we have all that. Yeah, it's just about everything. It's just everything looks normal too. Like it's very difficult to find what's actually causing it. So the know. the thing that gets me is it's like saying to someone like, if you do end up permanently paralyzed from the waist down for an epidural, contact your doctor and they'll tell you that there's absolutely nothing they can do about it. Like like oh, it's just so yeah. painful to listen to that. Like <sighs> but I anyway it has changed like I'm just done <laughs> same so. same well thank you so much for joining this morning I'm really glad that we were able to... oh last question mm. before I forget how has this impacted you financially how much money have you spent on this how much have you lost like what has been the financial impact of having this for you guys I've spent probably over a thousand dollars worth of supplements. Um, and I can tell you now that these supplements either didn't help or they just made me worse. But um, in terms of doctor visits, my insurance covers that. But if it wasn't, I would have spent thousands and thousands of dollars by now. So mm-hmm. it does take a toll on that as well. Hmm. I've spent thousands trying to work this out. Like I flew overseas to get a biopsy. Like I'm just so desperate to not have these symptoms anymore do anything to try and find what's wrong, get a diagnosis. I've probably spent, I don't know. I honestly reckon I would have said by the time I've gone overseas, everything it's, I would have spent at least like $15,000 even on the bills from like just American healthcare. If you don't have insurance, cause I went to the U S to get a biopsy. This is setting me back so much in my, just in my life. Like, you know, money that I'm spending here and there and here and there and stuff that's just not being covered. Mm. Um, Cause in Australia, like, you know, when you see a specialist, it's only covered by our public health care system to like an extent. And then you have to pay the gap. Even our private health insurance doesn't cover all of it. Like you still have to pay a gap and then in between that and then paying for like even a psychologist and like all of these things I've spent literally over probably getting close to 15 to twenty thousand dollars and like you know that's a lot of money for like someone my age that take it's not like I don't earn that very easily like that's like that's just like so much work and I feel like this I went and sought help because that's what I was told to do you chemically castrated me and now it's like you're mocking me by making me pay for it and sort it all out myself even though like this is so bad anyway it's just I think there'll be a lot of people that look back on this that think I can't believe we treated people like that yeah yeah it's, yeah it's in the thousands of dollars for me to uh, just go into different specialists and like um and different supplements and um I live in a remote community as well so like for me to see specialists I have to book a couple days off work and then take like eight hour car trips to get to the city to see a specialist so there's a big cost in that as well and yeah it definitely it it eats into your ability to live day to day in a lot of ways financial being one of them Mm. 
Yeah, I'm a bit uh bit different in that regard. So I haven't actually spent like hardly anything. So because mm-hmm. you know, I've read I've read online that people's experiences with this are not great, you know, when it comes to stuff like supplements and uh you know, I'm not I'm 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 quite lucky in regards that I haven't like had severe like cognitive problems to the point where like I can't study you know like it's mostly just sexual issues for me so it's you know so just (laughs) it's so bad yeah just it's you know it's already awful to begin with but you know it's uh but you know the fact that there's no you know there's so many people that have taken so many supplements and there's there's no there's nothing that cures this genital numbing so I just think you know is it worth it you know to try and treat sexual issues which you know they're probably not gonna respond to supplements well, we so. don't even know what like we we need to know why ssris are causing genital numbness yeah because if we don't even know why that's happening yeah. like how are we supposed to work backwards and treat that like if the it's I, treated the way i look at it is that you know i put i ingested something that cast castrated me uh, the way that I am now I don't want to ingest anything else that's yeah. I've already had damage done to my body I don't I don't yeah. want to damage it anymore you know um yeah for me a lot of the, the um attempts at like seeing specialists like endocrinologists or neurologists is just to sort of to cancel out um any other factors and because a lot of people will bring up things like, well, have you seen a psychiatrist? Have you gotten hormones checked? Things like that. I want to be able to say, yeah, I've gotten all that checked. I've seen all of the um, professionals who might be able to shed some light on it. And they haven't been able to find out what's wrong with me. So it's sort of process of elimination as well as just checking off all those boxes so that I can actually present my symptoms with credibility. Mm. Yeah. Well. We've all been through hell. Um, I really hope that this can hopefully get out to the right people and we can do something further about this because, you know, it's taken a huge toll on everybody's life who is dealing with it currently. And it will just continue to ruin lives if it doesn't get under control. So we just really, really need our informed consent and we really need something that needs to be done, such as research and treatments. That's kind of all we're asking. We don't want to shut down the pills. We don't want to shut down anybody taking them. Um, We just need help for everything that we're dealing with that was not given to us by informed consent. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for hosting, Rosie.